This week is special because I had a problem. Um, seems I had a whole bunch of movies that were kind of glutting up my hard drive, but the problem was is they weren't horror films, and I've been really focusing on those because, let's face it, there's a contingency of you guys that do not watch my non-horror timelines. But I gotta get rid of these things off my drive. So um, you're getting an entire week of non-horror timelines leading up to Friday, which will be horror related, but you've got Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, all different genres, starting with today's comedy timeline featuring, well, I figure it's summertime. Let's go to camp with meatballs. Camp season commenced back in 1979 with Meatballs and featured Steve Zissou in what was his first major film role. And at this time, he was currently a cast member of Saturday Night Live, and he says that it is June 25th. The movie has that classic opening theme song. And we're at Wacky Camp North Star, and this one was directed by the great Ivan Reitman, and although this wasn't his first film, it's the one that made him a known entity. The success of this film led to them doing Stripes, and then this little indie film called G uh, Ghostbusters that I think was pretty popular or something. Murray plays the head of the camp counselors as Tripper, and there's a sad kid named Rudy, who you may remember as Not Grady or Long Duck Dong in Vamp. There's an opposing camp called Camp Mohawk, that's the rich jerky kids, and there's Al here, played by Christine DeBell. Now, Christine here has been in a ton of movies and TV shows. She was in an early Jackie Chan movie, this one, Tag the Assassination Game, and even that movie, A Talking Cat? Lots of pretty notable things, but of course, IMDb lists her as being known for the one adult film she did back in 1976. There's also this song, Why is this film called Meatballs again? What, what does Meatballs have to do with camp? And hey, uh, who wants Italian? A scene at the bus station lets us know that we're in Canada, and Tripper definitely acts a bit creepy here. Like, this is pretty much straight up assault here. Tripper, get off me right now or I start screaming. Oh, at the count of three, I guess, huh? One, two. Ah! You said you had it, meatball. Oh, um, does that justify it? And here's a side story. The original script focused more on the camp in general and had more with all the various teens. But during shooting, they decided to switch the focus to Tripper and Rudy and shot more scenes with just the two of them and cut some of the other stuff. The graffiti on this door lets us know that it's past 1973 at least, and there's a calendar here, but it's too small to see. But then, my geek cred pays off, because this comic that Rudy here is reading is one of my favorites, and it's Marvel 2-in-1, and it's issue 50, where the thing faces off against his past lumpy self. I love that book. It came out in early 1979, so since it's the summer and June, or by this point, early July, it's the summer of 79 here. A little later, behind Tripper, there's some graffiti on the wall with dates slashed out going up to what looks like 77. They have the big intercamp games, and Trip gives his big old rousing movie speech. Just doesn't matter if we win or we lose. It just doesn't matter. But he does it in this satin shirt and sweatpants with visible mushroom cap combo. The crew rally and make a big comeback with Rudy winning the big race to break the tie. Camp ends with pretty much everyone getting a nice finish. But then something really weird happened. In 1984, Meatballs Part 2 arrived. 
It starts off the same way with a bus on the way to camp with the spleen driving it, but this is a new camp and it's Camp Sasquatch. And here's the thing, this is a different camp because this was meant to be an entirely different movie. It was written under the title Call Me Meathead for reasons that will soon become clear, but then changed to Summertime while they were shooting. When it was picked up for release, the studio simply changed the title to Meatballs 2 in order to sell it, which came as a pretty big surprise to the director, Ken Wiederhorn, who had previously done horror with Eyes of a Stranger and Shockwaves, and also did The Return of the Living Dead Part 2. There's a cover for Muscle and Fitness magazine, and it's from 1982, so it's possible that's our year, but it's also possible it's just an old issue. And the guy who stole Pee-wee's bike is here, so maybe he was just getting back at him for being a lousy bus driver. Richard Mulligan is running the camp, and how did he just completely avoid being in horror movies? And there's a wacky assortment of kids there, including, oh my god, the little kid that almost got Pee-wee's bike at that orphanage. Is this just like, hey, we feel bad that you had to be in that Meatballs fake sequel, so we'll make it up to you by putting you in a Tim Burton classic? The voice from the Texas Chainsaw intro works at the nearby military camp, but then, here's where the stakes a turn, um, a, a UFO lands and an alien heads out and dresses in a hat and scarf. And look, look at this dopey thing. It, it can walk through walls and they name him Meathead. And a little later, they're reading a Playgirl from January of 1983. So this is probably summer of 83 then? There's then a Vogue magazine, also from January 83, and Outdoor Life, also from January 83, which I'm going to assume was when this was filmed. But that seems to confirm the 83 date. When Sasquatch may be sold off, they make a bet over the big boxing match, but there's a sabotage, and meanwhile, Meathead gets high and watches shockwaves, and then the time comes for the big showdown. Main character Flash has to take on Ogre, but has the assistance of the alien. And like, no one questions this. Well, well, the Colonel does, and he goes to stop Meathead with a hand grenade under kids' bleachers. Well, he gets blown up and Flash wins the fight, or as much as you can win a fight that a blue slug from space helped you cheat at. Everyone wraps up happy, and of course, the meat goes home. I guess Meatballs was a legit franchise now, since two years later, in 1986, we got Meatballs 3 Summer Job. Little Baby McDreamy is here, and he's Rudy from the first film, and they mention Camp Northstar, and he even talks about Tripper. He's kissed goodbye by his mom, which is weird because it was a plot point in the first film that his mom had died about a year earlier. So I guess in between movies, his dad um, remarried or she came back from the dead, whatever. Rudy's supposed to go work for Tripper, but it turns out that he's retired and sold the business to Mean Gene here. We find out that adult film star Roxy Dujour has just died and it's hot lips and St. Peter is wearing Hudsucker and he won't let her into heaven and I guess she has to help Rudy get laid. Which is weird because just like two scenes ago, Wendy was trying to do the deed but Rudy was more interested in watching porn, so I guess this isn't a case of a guy who is unable to get laid, but a dude who just wants to hit outside of his weight limit. The marina is plagued by a boat gang called the River Rats, and hold up, hold up, the, the, the first meatballs had a little camp towel that was almost, almost family friendly and was just a story of some kids at a camp. The second one introduces aliens to this universe, and this one has super-powered angel porn stars. I'm feeling like the next one is going to have kaijus or something popping off. And then Roxy gives this advice. There's one more thing I want you to remember. No means yes. No means yes? No means yes. Sometimes a girl will play a little hard to get. Hmm. Let me see. Written by, yep, 
three dudes. He eventually tries to force himself on her and gets kicked in the balls, so let that be a lesson to you. If an angel tells you to physically assault someone against their will, do not listen to them. Correct that. If anyone, anybody tells you to physically assault someone against their will, d don't, don't listen to them. So Roxy says that in 10 years, he'll be 28. So he's supposed to be 18 now. I think in the original, he was supposed to be in his early teens. So this is around four or five years after that one. And if that was 79, that puts this at around 83 or 84. It was actually shot in 84. So I think that that was the intention. So we're gonna roughly place it there for now. Rudy tries to prove himself by sleeping with Playboy legend Shannon Tweed, and she agrees to help him out by faking having sex with him. And Jean's not even her husband, but her brother. And of course, the summer ends, and he ends up with Wendy anyway. But she has to basically change her entire appearance in order to be worthy of him, I guess. And then they back up that whole no really means yes thing, and Roxy gets into heaven. And to be clear, Wendy liked Rudy in the beginning, but this movie basically says, hey ladies, if you like a guy, it's fine. Just sit by and watch as he tries to sleep with every other woman he'll meet. And when none of that works, just stop wearing the clothes that you like and do your hair in a way that he'll like better. And then, maybe then you'll be lucky enough for him to bang you. There was a six year gap and it wasn't until 1992 that another entry was released and it was Meatballs 4, which shows us Lakeside Water Ski Camp, not North Star, but it does start in a familiar way with a wild bus. It's run by a racer head and some of the students are Return of the Living Dead 3 kid and why do all these camp kids look 30? Like I'm not exaggerating, this guy was 28 during shooting. The camp is in financial trouble and they have a new recreation director and it's OG Tommy Jarvis. And of course, there's a rich rival camp run by Ursa who wants to buy them out. Of course, this is another one that was never intended to be a part of the series. It was just a standard camp comedy entitled Happy Campers, but somewhere along the way, it was given a new title and made another part of the series. Although there's no connections outside of being set at a camp. This film is a bit notorious because it was during the filming of it that Jack Nance's wife called him to say that she was planning to commit suicide. While talking to her, a local storm killed the line and he was cut off. It took them a while to try to get in touch with anyone, but finally he was able to get through to LAPD, but when they went on to check on her, it was too late, and she had hung herself. There's camp functions with alcohol, so I guess that this is not supposed to be a youth camp after all, which is weird, because the campers talk about their parents quite a bit. But then Corey comes out to do the whole Feldman thing and dances to a thinly veiled imitation of black or white. <laughs> That makes me wonder if they cast him and then we're like, well, we have the Feld dog, so we have to put in a weird Michael Jackson style dance scene, or, or like, did he only agree to do Meatballs 4 if they specifically put it in? Plus, it's clearly adults since most of their recreational things involve nudity, like they do a whole strip contest thing, so these are clearly not school kids. Maybe, maybe college. There's of course a big ski competition, which they just barely win, but after some financial issues, they decide on a rematch and then follow the formula of the original to a T, including the rousing speech. Beat twin oaks, beat twin oaks, beat twin oaks. They have the rematch and there's some cheating going on and it all comes down to the final run. Edgar Frog nails a perfect score and wins the day and everything wraps up happy for everyone. And you know, there's no date in this one and nothing to tie it to anything else. So it's just in real time 92. 
It ends with this Ferris Bueller knockoff and a weird meta joke. Look, this isn't working. Some movie star you are. I was in Goonies. But that was it. There were not more sequels after that, and the franchise just went away. Although I'm sure that any day now, someone will say, hey, now that's an idea for a remake. So there you have it. It's four movies with a really weird continuity and timeline. Um, the first and third movie are absolutely linked together. But, uh, with just the character of Rudy carrying through and they mention North Star and Tripper, but that's it. Two and four are in no way connected and a completely separate continuity. Although there's really no saying that these movies don't all occur in the same universe. It's totally fine. Uh, I know there's aliens in the second one, but the third one has uh, super-powered angel porn stars which, you know, means that there's supernatural stuff in that universe that is the first movie. So by proxy, having that stuff in the second movie, isn't that weird? I don't know. Um, if you enjoy these movies, let me know down below. If you uh, did not enjoy these movies or this timeline, hey, wait 24 hours. There's going to be another one. Um, but, you know, hit the like button, hit the subscribe, um, click the bell if you want notified when new videos are out. And, of course, check out my Patreon page because these guys are my patrons and they are some happy campers. I hope they're happy campers. Um, Please be happy campers. Uh, you can be as well, too, by going to patreon.com slash movie timelines and helping support the channel. But you can also just tune in uh, like tomorrow and be ready for another great video. Thanks a lot, guys. Bye.